Go ahead and be seated. Thank you, praise team, as always, for helping us get our hearts ready for what God has for us today. We are wrapping up the second chapter of Romans. If you were here last week, you know this is the continuation of a message I started last week. It was going to be too long, so I obviously wanted to break it into, uh, into uh, two parts. So we're going we're gonna to finish those up here uh, this morning, and then we will move on, uh, obviously, into chapter 3, beginning chapter 3, one of the most important chapters uh, in, in all of Scripture next week as he explains to us the essence of salvation, how it works, how it doesn't work, why it's there, why God would choose to save us in the first place. Um, but if you remember last week, one of the things that I, the points that I tried to make was, in these last five verses of chapter 2, um, Paul uses terminology that could, if we're not careful in our reading of it, could seem very complex. They are very complex verses, by the way. Uh, most of that has to do with his use of words that we want to ascribe a technical definition to, circumcision, uncircumcision, what it means to obey the law, what it means to be a Jew. Um, these are all things that we, we know the technical definition, but he's not using those in, in this way. He's using them euphemistically. He's using them as figures of speech to, to um, reveal a larger truth. But it can kind of get a little mixed up there if we, don't, if we don't understand it. You'll see that as we go through it. Suffice it to say that the best way to look at these last five verses, and really the entire chapter, but especially the last half of, uh, of chapter 2 and specifically these last verses, is to remember who he's talking to or who he's talking about and why, what he's addressing. He is talking to, and this is where, if we understand it from this perspective, we see that we seem to have the same problem 2,000 years removed from the time that he's writing this. He's talking about a group of people who think they're saved, but they're not. They have placed their faith in their salvation in all external things, and he's trying to explain to them, you can't do that. We're going to see here in just a moment, as we continue on, that your salvation is not based on external things, it's based on internal things, and, and you, an internal transformation. You guys haven't been transformed, you're still hanging on. He's talking specifically to Jews in this particular point. He's talking to us 2,000 years related, about, uh, later about the same related things. He's saying you can't hang on to your salvation as being something outwardly in you, things that you do, that you're very religious, that you... Uh, anyway, we talked about that list last week. So that's who he's talking to, even 2,000 years removed from that. What he's talking about is something that's even more fundamentally important. He is addressing fundamental misunderstandings of the gospel. We have a, an epidemic in churches in this country, even in evangelical churches. I'm not sure quite how we got here, but we're here. That we have a fundamental, too many people have a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. I'm not talking about an exhaustive understanding of the gospel. I've been saved now for pushing 40 years. I still don't have an exhaustive understanding of salvation. I don't think I ever will this side of heaven. We don't have to have that, but we do have to have a fundamental understanding. What are the fundamentals of salvation, of Christianity? What is a fundamental understanding of the gospel? Because if we don't have that, i got to tell you, isn't it kind of hard to be saved? If we don't understand really what the gospel is, how can then we then embrace that gospel? And if we have an understanding of the gospel that's not actually the gospel, all we've done is put our faith in a gospel that doesn't exist. That's exactly what he's talking about here. He is talking about a group of people who have so convinced themselves that they're okay with God because of these external things. Well, I was born a child of Abraham. I know the law. I was circumcised. All of these external things, they thought they were fine and dandy. All of these religious things that they were doing, they thought they were great. And he was saying, you're not. In fact, he makes the comparison that you're just as lost as the group of people he was talking about earlier who had never even been shared the gospel, who didn't even know the gospel. He's making that comparison here. And he is addressing something that is extremely important to us, and that is, do we have a fundamental 
understanding of the gospel. Because without that, we are lost. No matter how religious we are, no matter how much we think we are close to God, we are lost. We will be among that group of people that Jesus was talking about when he said they're going to say to me, didn't, didn't we cast out demons in your name? We, we knew you. And he's going to say, I never knew you. And if you remember that passage which we referred to last week, Jesus said there would be many people like that who will go their entire lives convinced they're saved when they're not because of a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. You're going to keep hearing me use that phrase over and over and over again. And in these last five verses, if you remember, if you were here last week, what I did was, uh, is I engaged an implied question related to each one of these verses, each one of these things he's talking about. They all point to the same thing, but there's an implied question in each one of them, so we've been addressing those questions. And even though obviously we're not going to go through the ones we did last week, we're going to start with number three here, but I at least wanted to remind you of the first two questions. So as we go through these verses, we're getting ready to read here in just a second. The first implied question related to that verse is, what are you basing your salvation on? That's how he starts out. That's the implied question in that. How do you know you're saved? The second question he then goes on to that we covered last week was, have you been transformed by the gospel? That's the implied question for that particular passage. You're going to see that pattern continue here, especially that idea of being transformed by the gospel. Of the five implied questions here, the five verses that we're going to be looking at, three of them have to do with that aspect of being transformed by the gospel, of having a fundamental understanding of the gospel. And so let me read the verses here to you again. We'll read them beginning in verse 27 uh, on through the, uh, the, you know what, let's go back and read them, read them all so we have some, some level of context. We'll be 20, beginning in 25 through 29. We'll start with 27 and the implied question there. But this is in Romans chapter 2 beginning in verse 25. And again, it gets, it gets kind of confusing with the, with the verbiage, but if we understand the verbiage as we go through this, we'll, we'll understand what he's trying to say. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In the beginning of 27, the verses we're going to cover today. Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you. Who have, written, who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is one merely outward, nor is circumcision outward but fi- and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not for man, but from God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord, to delve into your word, Lord. You've given us these 66 books. It's hundreds of chapters, it's tens of thousands of words as the only way that you have revealed yourself to us. The only way you have chosen these 66 letters to show us who you truly are. My prayer is that our hearts and our minds will be opened to know you better if we belong to you or to know you for the first time if we are one of those people who just think we're okay and we're not, Lord. We want to know that. Show us that. That we can truly understand what it means to be a child of God. I pray you have free reign in this place this morning. And may you be lifted up and glorified. Amen. So we're looking at these last three verses here. Our first question, remember, what are you basing your salvation on? Quest, implied question number two, how you been, have you been transformed by the gospel? Implied question number three as we begin here this morning... Do you understand your sinful condition? This is, I cannot tell you how important this is. When you look at the verse, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. So again, the verbiage here gets a little confusing. He's talking about circumcised, uncircumcised, who's really circumcised, who's really not circumcised. When you understand what he's trying to say here, is he's making the distinction between these two groups of people. In the minds of the Jews who had been circumcised, who had known the law, who had been born children of Abraham, they thought they were okay. What Paul is saying here, 
The uncircumcised Gentile who has embraced the gospel is actually saved and you're actually not. I cannot tell you, again, the church today, Protestant church today is 99.999% Gentile, right? Back then it wasn't the case. I cannot tell you how radical this was. What Paul was saying here had never been said before and had certainly not been said to those people. They thought they were fine simply by virtue of being born. I was born a child of Abraham, so I'm good. He's saying no. And by the way, the uncircumcised Gentiles, oh, God would never love them. God would never care about them. And Paul is saying, yeah, these uncircumcised Gentiles who have embraced Christianity, embraced Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are actually the ones who are circumcised. He's actually using the word circumcised and uncircumcised as lost and saved here. That's the euphemism that he's attaching to it. And he's saying that because of that, you will be condemned. It's an interesting point. You will be condemned. He's talking about people who thought they were saved, and he's saying, you're not saved, you're condemned. Why? Why are they condemned? What is it about them that is condemned? Because they were focusing on the external aspects. They thought they had external problems. And what God is saying here, what he continues to say throughout all of the scripture is, your problem is not external. Your problem is internal. Your problem is your heart hasn't been circumcised, which is an interesting analogy that he uses in this last verse that we'll get to here in just a few minutes. You are condemned because your sin has not been atoned for. If we do not understand our natural sinful condition, we cannot be saved. We can't. I cannot tell you how important. Hey, by the way, everybody raise your hand when you love talking about sin. Who loves talking about sin? Nobody loves talking about sin. They don't. Here's the problem. If you don't like talking about sin, you are really going to hate reading God's Word. You're not going to like that at all. Because from Genesis to Revelation, he talks about it over and over and over and over again. Because if we don't understand that we do not have a behavior problem, which is what the Jews thought, it's all based on my behavior, that I obey the law, that I'm circumcised, that whatever. If we don't understand that sin is not something that we do, it is who we are. It is our very nature. In fact, in this very letter, Paul's going to say, we are by nature children of wrath. It is a, we are not born with a good heart that gets corrupted. We are born with a corrupted heart. We are born with the desire to do the exact opposite of what God wants us to do. Jesus talked about that. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery, a physical act. What does he say? No, no, no. If you've even looked on somebody with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Whether you actually commit the actual act or not, it doesn't matter. That's how corrupt we are. Why is this so important? Because if I don't think, if I don't realize and understand my sinful nature, why in the world do I need a Savior? Why? Jesus becomes a self-help guru. That's what Christianity becomes, to make me a nicer person, a better person. You see how that works, right? We are told in Scripture that sin isn't born in our actions. It's concluded in our actions. Sin is born in our hearts. That's the way it works, right? The sin begins here in our hearts. We rationalize it with our brain, and then we do it with our hands. And even if we don't do it, we're still doing it because it's already embedded into our hearts. I cannot tell you how important this is. This is one of the most fundamental misunderstandings that people have about the gospel. They do not understand how desperately they need it. They don't. It sounds cool. God loves me and he died for me. Well, why did he die for you? And why did he die in that way? Why so brutally? Because that's how bad sin is. <laughs> when you look at the entirety of the Bible, and this is not easy to do, trust me, and you look at the entirety 
of the Bible, it can be summed up in one sentence. And here's the sentence. We are completely enslaved to our sinful nature, but God can save us from that through the death, burial, and resurrection of His Son. Everything else in Scripture points to that. Everything else stems from that. All the cool stuff about Him being with us and comforting us when we're, when we're sad and, and when we mourn and, and giving us courage when we're fear, that's all ancillary stuff. That's all stuff that comes from that. The ultimate reason why we fundamentally misunderstand the gospel is because we fundamentally misunderstand what sin is. And there has, of course, become a rash of churches out there that I'm going to be honest with you, they simply don't talk about it. Because it's hard to fill a 100,000 seat arena if you're talking about sin. It really is. I saw a, um, an interview with a megachurch pastor one time for anonymity's sake, we'll just refer to him as J. Osteen. No, 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 that's too obvious. That's too obvious. Uh, we'll call him Joel O. Uh, he was asked about this in the interview, about why he didn't talk about sin. And this was his response. Well, they're already in church, so they already know that they're sinners. I don't know. I'm going to be nice. I think that's very naive. I really hope that it's just naivete. That's the reason people go to church, especially circus churches. That's where they go. Not to be entertained. Not to hear a feel-good message. Not to be told over and over again that, Yo, yeah, you're, just, you're not really that bad a person. You're just misunderstood. I wish that everybody was flocking to churches because they were aware of their sin. That does not happen. 80% of evangelicals believe that people are basically good. How is that being aware of your sin? That is the exact opposite of what Scripture tells us. In Psalm 51, one of my absolute favorite psalms on the planet, and I think we look at it in, in the wrong way sometimes. David, Wright has, David writes, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my trans, uh, iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You know that part in there, the one that always jumps out to me? My sin is ever before me. My sin is always before me. I got to tell you, I think we make a mistake with that passage. I think we treat it as a lament when should, we should be treating it with joy. I want my sin to be ever before me. I don't ever want to forget it. I don't ever want to downplay it. I want to hate it with a white-hot hatred that God has for all sin. And I can't do that if I push it to the side, if I claim I'm not really that bad, that I'm basically a good person. In the eyes of the world, maybe that's true, but we're not talking about the world. And if we don't understand our sinful nature, it doesn't make us evil, horrible people. It just makes us in desperate need of a Savior. How in the world could I ever look at the gospel as saving me if I don't understand the depths of what I needed to be saved from? I can't. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. Jesus is not interested in improving you. I don't need to be an improved sinner. I don't need to be an improved sinner child of wrath. I need those things to be gone. I don't need to be those things anymore. 
which is what we'll get to here in just a second. You want to talk about a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel? You keep thinking that you're basically a good person. Because we're going to read in, in Romans 3 here in just a couple of weeks, God's indictment on all of humanity. And it ain't pretty. And he's talking about everybody. You're going to read those verses and you're going to think, man, that person sounds terrible. I wouldn't want to be them. We are them. And if we don't understand that, salvation means nothing. That is a fundamental misunderstanding. If we don't understand our sinful nature, there is no way we can be saved. Question number four, tied directly to this. You can see how all of these, quest, these implied questions build on all these verses build on this. In verse 28, the, quest, the implied question is here, are you a new creation? Do you simply think of yourself as a better person than you were before you were saved? Do you understand what actually happened when we embrace Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you a new creation? Look at verse 28, 28, and this had to make a lot of people mad at the time, I'm sure. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Paul is basically redefining here what it means to be a Jew. He's using the term euphemistically here. He's using it as a figure of speech, as someone who is... Well, so ultimately, what did it mean to be a Jew? What does it mean to be a Jew today? I would assume, I don't know, I'm not Jewish, but at least back then, what did it mean to be a Jew? That you were in a covenantal relationship with God. And that you're okay because you were born into this covenantal relationship with God. He's not talking about, he's not redefining it in the sense that say, believers are now Jewish. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the perfect ideal of what it means to be Jew is to be in a personal relationship with with God, and they weren't, even though they thought they were. Jesus, by the way, completely redefined that. So it was so cool, even though I, 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 didn't even, I wasn't even paying attention. With the uh, call to worship that we looked at this morning, talking about the new covenant. If you go back to Luke's gospel in chapter 22, we see what Jesus is talking about here. And how radically things had changed in Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, this is during the Last Supper, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it, I eat it until, the, uh, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said to them, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. There is a new covenant covenant and he was Paul was telling these people who thought they had a covenantal relationship with God you don't you don't I don't care how religious you are I don't care how many times you go to church I don't care how many times you go to the different Bible studies I don't care how much you like it or are attracted to it you do not have a covenantal relationship with God because you are not a new creation that's what God did for me when he saved me he did not improve me. Did my behavior improve? Approve? Well, yeah. Of course it did. Is that the point? No. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is wrapped up in a passage you've heard me refer to many times that I'll read here again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Listen carefully to what Paul writes here. And take it literally because he's not speaking figurative. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We are a new... I am literally, literally not the same person I was before I was saved. Literally, not figuratively. I am a new creation. I was born, we talked about that Ezekiel passage, right? Where God says, I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. We were all born with a heart of stone. All of us. 
every single human being that has ever been born on this planet is born with that heart of stone. And in the eyes of our fellow people, our fellow, our neighbors, we might be the nicest people. How many times have I told you before? I think I mentioned it last week. If you had known me before I was a Christian, you would have thought I was a nice guy. And you wouldn't have been wrong. I was a nice guy. I didn't do horrible, terrible things. I did stupid things because I was a kid and I was a sinner. But I wasn't a horrible guy. But I had a heart of stone. And I viewed things a certain way. I understood the world in a certain way that was completely upside down. It was completely wrong. And he didn't fix that stone heart. He didn't say, ah, let me chip away there. Maybe get a little better shave. I'll throw some water on it. Maybe that'll soften it up. He removed that heart and gave me a completely new one and gave me and made me a new creation. Are you a new creation? That's the litmus test. All of these things, to a certain extent, are litmus tests about this. He was telling those folks who thought that they were okay when they were not okay, you're not a new creation. You think and believe like everybody else. That is one of the biggest evidence. You've heard the term that believers need to have a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview. That's what he's talking about here. Let me ask you something. Do you think like the world thinks? Do you believe like the world believes? Do you value what the world values? Do you tolerate what the world tolerates? Do you celebrate what the world celebrates? If so, you are not a new creation. You're not. I got to tell you something. I was having this conversation with somebody earlier this morning about this. We should be very uncomfortable on this planet. If you're a believer, you should feel very, very uncomfortable. You should feel like people don't like you because of your faith. You know why? Because that's true. The scripture tells us that. You should feel like you don't fit in. That people misunderstand you because they do. Do you see the point here? Oh, the, the implied question is here, are you a new creation? Or are you the same person you were before, but now you've got some little bit of religion sprinkled on you? that we have a tendency to pull out when it benefits us, and kind of push it to the side when it doesn't. I am, in so many ways, this is all to God's glory, by the way, unrecognizable than the person I was when I was 19 years old. I am un... I look back at that guy. <laughs> I look back at that guy and remember what I thought and what I felt. If you celebrate everything the world celebrates, if you believe like they believe, guess what? You're like them. You're like them. You're indistinguishable from them. And the scripture tells us over and over and over again. How many times have we talked about this transformation? And here he's talking about it again. If we are not a new creation, then we have a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. We will continuously look at it as a religious self-improvement program. There are millions of people sitting in churches all over this country at this very hour who literally believe that they're okay. And they're not. They're not. They have not been transformed in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean they don't like church. Some of them love church. They love going to church. They love hearing the messages. But because they have not been told the fundamental understanding of the gospel, they have missed it. And lastly, he wraps it up by basically telling us that this was the topic of all he was talking about in the first place. The last question is, do you have a heart of flesh? Or probably a better way to ask the question is, do you have a fundamental understanding of the gospel? But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So he wraps all of this up by asking implied here, the implied question here that he's asking all of us is, do you really, really 
understand the gospel. I've asked you this before. I'm going to ask you again. You'll hear me ask it many, many more times. I'm not looking for an out loud answer. I just want you to answer it to yourself. Somebody came up to you and knew you were a Christian and asked you, heard the word gospel and asked you, okay, what does that mean? What, what is the gospel? What would you say to them? What would you say to them? Would you be able to articulate that? Not exhaustively, but fundamentally. What do you be able to explain to them? Jesus died for you, okay? So why did he die for me? You going to be able to answer that question? How about this one? This is a good question. God's all powerful, right? Why did he just forgive everybody's sin? Why the whole cross and the resurrection thing? God could do whatever he wants. Why don't you just forgive everybody's sin? Just, just wipe his hand and say, I forgive everybody on the planet everything that they've ever done. Is that a good question? That is a really good question. <laughs> People are going to ask that question. What are you going to say to that question? You see what I'm talking about here? Do you have a fundamental understanding of the gospel? Do you really know what it is, how it saves us, why it saves us. How we've embraced it, whether we've embraced it. I hope you see the importance of what Paul is doing here. 2,000 years ago, he is still talking about a problem that we have today. A problem that is epidemic in the churches in this country today. A study after study after study shows that evangelical people who refer to themselves as evangelical believers don't understand the rudimentary elements of Christianity. They don't know. They can't talk about it. See, i got to tell you, <laughs> I think that's a problem. Paul thought it was a problem. And one of the ways that we can do that, and I usually do this sometimes after the message, but I thought, you know, this is, the, this is a perfect spot to do this in, is to look at what the gospel is. To just look at it. I'm going to give you the basic, <laughs> fundamental understanding of the gospel. But as you've been here before and you've heard me do this, one of the best ways to see what something is is to understand what it's not. To clear up misconceptions, we'll start with that. What the gospel is not. The gospel is not going to church. The act of going to church is not the gospel. Hopefully it is where you will hear the gospel, and it's a good thing. Should we go to church? Is going to church a good thing? Going to church is a great thing. It's not the gospel. The gospel is not reading the Bible. The act of reading the Bible is not the gospel. There are plenty of people out there who read the Bible who have never been touched by the gospel in any way, shape, or form. I think I've shared with you before, I had a college professor that said he was an atheist, an agnostic. He said he read the Bible every day. Reading the Bible is not the gospel. It is where you read about the gospel, but it is not the uh, gospel. Is reading the Bible a good thing? Reading the Bible is a great thing, and we should do it. It's not the gospel. The gospel is not simply believing in God. It's not. There are tons of people who believe in our adversary. The devil believes in God. Believing in God is not the gospel. Is believing in God important? Yeah, I would say it probably is. It's not the gospel. And the gospel is not doing good things. Is doing good things a good thing? Yes, it's not the gospel. It's not. We have a tendency to see all of these external things as the gospel, and it's not. And Paul is desperately reaching out to his own people. He so, Paul so wanted his fellow Jews to believe. Do you remember what he said about that? He said, if I could be condemned to basically spend an eternity in hell, if God would condemn me and it meant saving all of my fellow Jews, I would do it. I haven't gotten to that point where Paul is right now. <laughs> I, I hope and pray that someday I would. He said something I wouldn't say. He is desperately wanting to tell a group of people who think they're great, they're not great. 
That is the whole underlying aspect of the gospel. You're not great. Not even close. You're not even good. Because if we don't get that, we will never want a savior. We'll want a helper and a, a, a religious assistant to guide us on our path. So that was what the gospel is not. Here are the fundamentals of the gospel. And I am so grateful, as complex as it can get, that he makes it this simple. Number one, recognize that we are sinners. We're not going to go over that again. We just spent an entire section of that. We have to recognize and understand the depth of our depravity as far as God sees it. Know that our sin separates us from God. That sin keeps us from having a relationship with Him. We cannot have a relationship with God with unforgiven sin in our lives as unbelievers. Realize that we owe a debt for that sin, whether we think we do or not. It doesn't matter what we think. It matters what He thinks. He's not hiding this from us. He tells us over and over again, and He says the wages of sin is death. That is the punishment that every single human being on the planet deserves from the time that they are born. Is we are deserved of that punishment, of that judgment. We owe that debt for that sin. Number four, accept that this makes us an enemy of God. People have a hard time with this one. Before I was a believer, I would have told you a million times, I'm not an enemy of God. Of course, I never asked him about that. I just came to that conclusion. No, nah, God's pretty cool. I'm cool with him. He's cool with me. Neither one of those things were true, of course. We are his enemy. You know why it's so important to be reminded about this? You know why my sin is ever before me should not be a lament? Because the more I'm reminded of my sin, the more I'm amazed by the cross and the empty tomb. It points me back to his salvation. My sin and the recognition of my sin points me back to the cross every single time. I hope I never forget that. I don't ever want to get to the point where I think, I don't want to see my, it looks not, it's not fun, it's not, there's, there's no enjoyment in that, but there is rejoicing. That when I recognize my sin for what it is, the first thing I see is the cross and the reminder of what he did for us. So accept that this makes us an enemy of God. Understand that Jesus paid the debt that we owed him on the cross in total, 100%. He didn't pay 98% of it or 99% of it or 99.9% .9 of it. Our salvation is dependent exclusively and completely on His finished work at the cross and the empty tomb. You want me to give you the really good news about that? The really, really good news? Here's the really, really, really good news. Because of that, when I sin. Today, as a believer, we are going to continue to struggle with sin, with that old nature. It has already been paid for. God does not make me pay for my sin because He paid for it. Now, I might have to suffer some temporal consequences of my sin, obviously. That's not going to go away. It's already paid for. He does not punish me for my sin. I, that is overwhelming to me. He will never punish me for my sin. Ever. Because Jesus took all of that punishment. In fact, when he looks at me, even when I am at my worst, he sees his son. We're going to see that in chapter 3. The righteousness that belongs to Christ is placed on me at the moment he saved me. And he sees his son instead of seeing my sin. That it is so overwhelming to me, I don't, I don't even have the words. And then lastly, of course, confess and believe. Recognize we are sinners, know that our sin separates us from God, realize we owe a debt for that sin, accept that this makes us an enemy of God, understand that Jesus paid that debt in total on the cross, confess and believe. That's it. That's, that's, the, that's a fundamental understanding of the gospel. What do you believe? 
What do you really believe? I have told you over and over again, and I will give you the disclaimer again. We are not talking about this so that believers will question whether or not God has saved them. That is not the point of this. The point of this is for us to be able to look at it and say, what am I basing all of this on? How do I know? How do I know? And we see those questions, don't we? We see them. We see those verses. We see those passages. We see those things where he tells us. It culminates in 1 John when he said, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you, and I love this part. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. This is not something we can play at. Why do you go to church? Why do you like going to church? Does it make you feel good? Sometimes that happens. Sometimes not so much. He is trying to get us to look at the essence of salvation. He is trying to get us to see what we really actually believe and why. So that I can stand in front of you right now in spite, not because of, in spite of everything that I have done. That is the opposite of what God has wanted me to do. That's why I can stand up you here in front of you with 100% confidence and be able to clearly tell you that when I draw my last breath on this planet, I will stand in front of the king of the universe and he will say, well done. Well done. And I'm probably going to be confused. Well done. You know how many times I did this, how many times I did that? But it won't be because of anything that I've done. In fact, it's going to be in spite of everything I've done. And it's going to be because of everything he did for me. This is so important that Paul focused these five verses on that one thing. And that is, do you understand, really and truly understand and believe the gospel? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you have given us here this morning, Lord. These extraordinary verses that we have gone through over the last two weeks, Lord. And, and as we continue... Uh, to, to uh, make our way through this amazing letter uh, as you begin to prepare our hearts for, uh, for the things that we have coming up, Lord, as we delve into this next chapter where you're going to explain to us in crystal clear, unambiguous terms what it actually means to be saved, what salvation actually looks like. And Lord, if there's anybody here or if there's anybody that might hear this later on, begins to wonder if they actually belong to you, Lord. If they do, reassure them. Lord, that's my prayer. Your spirit will reassure them. And if they're not, but they think they are, Lord, here's my prayer. Don't let them be able to sleep at night. Don't, Lord, don't, don't let them be able to sleep until they see the truth and the majesty and the glory and the grace of your gospel. May we be willing, ready, and able in our lives to communicate this gospel to a world that so desperately, desperately needs to hear it. And may you be lifted up and glorified. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.